Welcome back. Our next flash talk is on micro living. Please welcome Mimi Wong, co-founder in Architects. Good morning. I'm here to talk about micro living, but it's not just micro, it's micro macro. Um, because living in a small unit should not necessarily be a diminished experience. Um, I'm a co-founding partner of N Architects, and three years ago we completed New York City's first micro-unit apartment building. It was a public competition launched by our then mayor, my, Mayor Bloomberg, um, with the question, should we shrink the minimum size of apartments in New York? At that time, it was 400 square feet. Should we shrink it to something smaller? And can it still be humane? And then should we rewrite the zoning code in order to allow for alternate modes of living? The story of the micro unit really begins with Jacob Rice, the Danish immigrant photojournalist who, at the turn of the century, turned his cameras onto the immigrant poor of New York, exposing the horrific living conditions, lack of sewage, lack of light and air, um, lack of proper anything. And so his book, How the Other Half Lives, published in 1895, really shocked the civic leadership into action because at that time, this is a living condition of nearly half of the city's population. So it's really important to understand that the housing regulations, the standards for light and air that we have now come from this um, point in time. But at that time, families were much larger. So the paradox now is that our houses, average size of homes, have ballooned. They have almost doubled from the 1950s to now. But our households have been shrinking. We are different. We have changed. We are marrying later. Women are studying more. We are living healthier and living longer. And so the result is that nearly half of Manhattanites live by themselves. And this is a trend that is not just privy to New York. It's a national trend and is also reflected internationally. Look at Stockholm and Amsterdam. What this means in New York is that we currently have only one million small household housing stock, but we are actually 1.8 small households. In New York, we define it as one to two people households. So what are our options? We are cramming ourselves into illegal sublets that are unhealthy, where we don't have a right to lease or we don't have proper windows, or there is a very long commute. And so the idea of the micro units is to potentially mitigate the cost of transportation, of being far from, from your work, um, and to uh, shrink downsize the, the, um, the home that you live in. But for us as architects, how can we think about micro-macro and macro-to-micro -macro strategies? How can we think about nested scales of community, the building in its neighborhood, the community of the building, the community of your floor, et cetera, what can we share if our houses are that small? This is the site of Carmel Place. It was finished in 2016. It's in lower Manhattan. It is next to public housing. It's a block from the tr public transportation. It's next to the park. And it is very much thought of as architecture and housing, uh, uh, the architecture of housing is part of the social and physical infrastructure of buildings. Home is not just the four walls of your apartment. And so for us, we were thinking about how do you rethink apartment living? If your home is 300 square feet, how can you live beyond the four walls? How can you activate the public spaces and put them in places that would encourage people to interact? The corollary of our obsession with technology is that we are virtually connected in digital space, in virtual space, but in the physical realm, we are quite disconnected from each other. And so the goal is to treat the social amenities of housing um, as the front porch, as the street, as the kind of spaces that would catalyze social interaction. Because if the unit is small, 
the living should not be necessarily. And so we worked to upsize everything else if we shrank the unit. Um, and so the windows are overscaled, et cetera. Um, the project is also built of many small parts in a way. Um, it's prefab, modular construction. So this is a video of the um, uh, warehouse in uh, the Brooklyn Navy Yard where it was built. Um, prefab is conducive uh, for, for this kind of uh, building type because there are there's so many constraints uh, and so many tight tolerances. We were building to about an eighth of an inch tolerance, which is not possible in, in traditional construction. They literally snap together, almost like Legos. Um, and when they arrive on site, everything is already there. The plumbing is in, all the electrical lights are in, all the finishes are in. Everything is actually closed up, almost. Um, except for the appliances, and they are shipped across the, the bridge at midnight uh, to avoid congestion. Um, and they literally stack one on top of each other because the structure is inherent to the unit. There's no primary structure and that the units um, uh, attach to. This video makes it look really easy. It was not. Um, but the stacking process itself took three and a half weeks. And everything was a module, including the stair core and the elevator shafts. So each unit and a little bit of the corridor is a prefab module. There are 55 units. Um, it's a small building. 55 units, 40% are affordable. Out of that 40%, 8% went to formerly homeless veterans. That left 14 uh, apartments that were open to the public housing lottery system. For those 14 units, there were 60,000 applications. I'm not telling you this statistic because I think that everybody wanted to live in a piece of architecture. I think it's a really depressing statistic and one that just speaks to the dearth of affordable housing and how much we need it. On the interior of the apartment, if we shrink the floor plate, what are we giving back? We thought we should give back in terms of ceiling height. So the interesting thing is that we shrank the floor plate by 25% from 400 to 300 square feet. We only shrank the volume by 10%. So the qualitative things of the amount of light and air, where that is, what it looks onto, how your unit connects to the social amenities of the, um, the rest of the building matters. Um, and so we cannot think about affordable housing only in terms of the metrics of data of how many units, uh, affordable units a, a city needs, but we really have to think of it much more holistically so that living in your apartment also means that you're living within your neighborhood in a much larger context. I was so worried about going over time, but I'm under time. Thank you very much. Okay.